Hello and welcome to Profiles in Risk with your host, Tony Canyons. And I think we're recording episode 205, 206, yeah. somewhere in wow. there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a while. And today I have with me uh, John Isaacson of the Diojo, and that's spelled D Y, but it oh. sounds like Dojo. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Yourself, Just with a, uh, a Y in there. Uh, so John, thank you, thank you for joining me today. And, and John is an interesting character who has been kind of in the periphery of of insurance nerds for a good several years. But I, I, I like you were kind of always there, but I never really like. I mean, yeah. Since you you're not like an underwriter or a claims adjuster, right? Or a, right? I, I never really thought much about exactly what you do, uh, really, until we scheduled the podcast. Uh, <laughs> so so t- tell t- tell tell us about about yourself. What what exactly do do you do? Uh, so I, I I was trying to think about it like uh, be, before we got on, and and same thing like how do we provide value to the people that are listening? So. From what I gather from being like on the Slack with insurance nerds and I've written some articles and those kinds of things, um, like in general, the the Diojo, the the whole thing with the Diojo, it's the do your own job dojo. So I've, you know, developing my own career and then helping other people and managing other people. It's, you know, um, it's really not that complicated. We oftentimes make it more complicated than it needs to be. So it's just, if you master your job, make other people's jobs easier. If you make your boss's job easier, that's going to be a, um, you know, a faster track towards promoting in your career. Mm -hmm. And then as you're working for other people, you know, if you reach out to clients and you make their job easier, that tends to net you more work. Right. So, um, so professionally, um, uh, I think it's 18 years now I've been doing water and fire damage. So anybody that's working in insurance, all the stuff and the policies and those things, you know, my experience has been when what, what occurs on the property side, you know, where there's a water or fire damage, you know, I've been working with and leading teams that respond to that aspect of insurance. So, okay. So, so f- as a former claims adjuster, and I, I was never a property yeah. adjuster. I, I, I okay. was, uh, on the uh, on the call center where we took the call, uh, okay, and, and we kept most of the auto, a little bit of the property, uh, and and then I was I was a, a injury adjuster, but I was never like a field wow. property adjuster. Uh, yeah. But from from my perspective, right, being involved in the in the industry for 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 now a decade in different ways, basically, when when there's a water loss. You call us, or you call your agent, re- re- report the loss, and then like your agent, if, if you have a local agent, might show up, uh, like physically show up to to like take a picture or like make you feel better, really, uh, file help you file the claim with the, with, with the carrier kind of thing. But then it's basically call somebody, right? It, it, it's it's yeah. it's like right? we don't come in to fix it for you. We yeah. we we pay for it minus your deductible. And we investigate, make sure that it's covered, make sure that you're, that, that everything's is right. But but then we, we, can, we kind of hand it over and wait for the bill, basically, right? Uh, I agree. Yep. From, from my perspective, magic happens there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I know that that uh, uh what, what are they called? Big fans are involved. Yep. <laughs> if you're drying, yep, yep. Carpet gets ripped out, and we don't, and, and we want to do it quickly so so that we don't end up with mold. And that, yeah. that is the extent of, of how I understand it. So, so uh, color in the lines of the, 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 like, give it, give it, give it some, some meat. Uh, or what exactly is it that, that, that you guys in, in water restoration do when you show up and a home is happening? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember. I was just listening to a podcast and I guess agents used to be a lot more involved. Like they used to, Maybe it was my own podcast. <laughs> um, I just did a uh, did an interview with a guy, John Downey, that runs Siri C I R I, um, and uh, their uh, scientific side of of what we do. But, but uh, your agent used to it used to be a lot more like most things, right? You used to buy something from someone, and then that someone was very engaged in the process, right? And so it used to be like you said, the agents would go out. Um, take a look and they might cut a check directly from their office for it, it, getting it started. That is, is becoming yeah. 
rare. Like, like as yeah. don't like uh, extremely the rare. Yeah, yep. ex exactly. So the agents, the agents sort of become more of like, you know, the sales face. Um, and I think like, uh, uh, you know, from my standpoint, like we always tried to reach out to agents because we want to help them. So like if you have, say in your scenario, say uh, a toilet overflowed, right? And you're not quite sure if it's a big loss or a little loss, you know, that a bunch of water, you got it up as best you could with towels, maybe at a shop vac, right? So you call the agent. Um, and the agent might say, the agent has a couple of options, depends on which carrier they work for. They might say, well, call the 1-800 number. You know, we don't deal with that, you know, and it's, I think that's a terrible practice uh, for uh, agents mm -hmm. because why, why not go with Progressive or Geico then if, if I don't have anybody advocating for me? So the agents that are engaged in the local market, they might have vendors that they know. Um, it's tricky because everything's so interconnected now. So the and big carriers, in have, a lot of carriers. Yep, and have preferred vendors and then liability plays an issue too. If I recommend somebody and they screw it up, then we're all in trouble. Whereas if I go with the system and I make them call the 1-800 number, then there's less liability for me as the agent, right? Mm -hmm. So absolutely, it's this weird, you want your local agent selling and involved and, and providing a customer experience and yet, you know, their hands are kind of tied. So it's, tricky the sales is tricky nowadays right because of all the things that happen so whether the agent refers a company um and and what we used to say like um because to, to the best of my understanding like your um your deductible is based off of like rates from the 80s it was always supposed to be like like one percent or something like that of the value of your home and it never caught up like insurance companies play around every now and again with trying to make that percentage. The last one I can remember was state farm. And to my knowledge, they went back to the 500, a thousand, you know, that most people are, are, are familiar with. And so, um, so you, you, so if you have a high deductible, that water loss might actually be less extensive than you think. So we might be able to dry it out and, and maybe repair the baseboard or whatever, um, for less than that thousand dollars. So, you know, if you file a claim, you've now got that ding on your record, quote unquote, and you're not getting anything back from the insurance company. So it might be in your best interest to, to work with somebody local. Whereas the other hand, it may, it seemed like it was small and, you know, it just hit the right plane and water went everywhere and it's much larger than you thought, or maybe there was ongoing type of issue. So, so that's what we call that mitigation or the emergency response. That's the fans. Typically you're pulling baseboard, trying to figure out you want to know the source of the loss and the extent, you know, where did it come from and then where did it go? And then, you know, in the toilet example, if it came from beyond the P trap, you know, which is down the drain, then you're dealing with biological contaminants and those kinds of things, you know, from the sewer lines. So there's different practices you want to, you don't want to just throw fans on that because then you might be kicking all of that and water I, in the air. I, I think it's, it's important to 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 mention that that. Oh, I thought you were in California. No, you're 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 in 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 the Pacific North Northwest. I was going to say in California that, that the environmental exposure is is a huge deal. Uh, but yep. okay, Pacific Northwest. Okay. Um, well, we're Seattle. Whatever California does, it's like we're next. <laughs> like, oh yeah, let's copy that. <laughs> okay. Go, 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 gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so so how. Um, so do, do you guys deal uh, with, with the claims adjusters uh, or uh, like do you yeah. negotiate with the claim adjuster at, at, after the service or during yeah. the service or how, how does that usually interface? Yeah. So, so if you're the homeowner, right, you might call, call your agent and your agent um, is supposed to help you through that process, but they have limited authority when it mm -hmm. comes to the claims, right? Very. Um, uh, other than, you know, one thing I would like to point out is if you, if your whole, uh, the way you buy insurance is for the cheapest policy possible, just make sure they haven't cut out critical things that you're going to need, you know, if there's a water or a fire damage. And typically fire damage causes a lot more because you have fire and water because the fire department comes in and sprays things down. So the agent has a lot of input at the, the point of sale, especially for businesses right and and we're experiencing that with covid and everything and 
understanding what is and isn't covered and and that's all very important so so then it goes to the claim center and then depending on the company and the size of the loss they might send out what they call a field adjuster and that's somebody that goes out and, and physically inspects and maybe puts a scope of work and an estimate together um, and or it could be an independent adjuster which is they're not captive by that carrier they work for multiple carriers in that area or they might handle it all from the desk um, especially if they have a preferred vendor program where you know this this insurance carrier works with this company or this rotation of companies so they might rely on that contractor to follow through and so that's a, I think I mentioned I'm writing a book right now called Be Intentional Estimating. That's whole, that whole process is, it's so much more than just writing a sheet of paper, right? There's, there's a lot involved with, um, and that the goal is because the program that most carriers use is called Xactimate. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Bas basically this program that's interjected all these spreadsheets and costing and it's supposed to, um, you know, make it, clearer for all parties to understand because you have the the homeowner which is the client the contractor and the carrier all those people to be able to negotiate from the same apples to apples right you know to to speak in the common language i guess for the claim and try to understand let's how do we put you back to pre-loss conditions no more no less you know so do you guys also use exactimate or yes. okay yep. so 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 we truly are all kind of on the on the on the same yeah, they system to to. Yeah, it's. Mediate. I would say, eighty percent of the claims, you know, um, run through Xactimate, and insurance companies seem to almost across the board. There's like, a couple outliers like Simbility and, um, like if you work with FEMA, I don't remember what the program's called, but it's it's much much older, and they still it's like on mm -hmm. DOS, you know, here right now. Yeah, your <laughs> carriers, uh, Xactimate is is wildly popular. Like, yes, like by yep. far the standard. Uh, yep. Yeah, there are weird weird pockets here or there, but but by far the standard. Yep. Like myself, you're you're kind of involved in ten thousand things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so 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 tell me about 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 kind of all the other stuff that you, that you're doing, kind of around the the uh, around your day job. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, um, I, I think, okay. So maybe before, if we could take a sidestep, I was thinking we met, I reached out to you when you and Carly released the, um, book, um, uh, uh insuring tomorrow, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, about working with millennials and those kinds of things. And I think that might've been one of the first times I reached out to an author to kind of review a book and do like a formal, you know, like break it down and try to, you know, spread the word. And so um, I've always written um, and, and really enjoy writing, but uh, I think you said you've been in the industry for 12 years. What got you into insurance? They, they had a job. <laughs> right. Was that, I mean, did you go to school? You didn't go to school intending no, to be an insurance I, or yeah. Yeah. I, nope. I didn't even go to go to, uh, to a school that had a risk management program. It, okay. I, I worked in transportation for almost four years and then okay. in, in 09, the, when the economy crashed, I got downsized yeah. and it first, yeah. I, I applied everywhere and the first job I got happened to be at Farm Bureau. Uh, oh, wow. And yeah, complete accident. Absolutely. And were you in under, did, were you in underwriting then or what was um, your? Two, two years in claims, then underwriting. And then I kind of bounced between sales management and underwriting kind of. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's super rare that you meet anybody in the insurance realm that, you know, set out to be an insurance, you know, so. But <laughs> even the people that, that were lucky enough to graduate with a risk management and insurance degree generally did not show up in school looking for a risk management and insurance right. degree. Right, they, kinda, they showed up at the right school looking for like a business degree, and then yeah. they got recruited into the risk management program with yeah. uh, free free pizza and great career op opportunities. Uh, <laughs> no, like it, it's it's almost funny how often that is the case. Uh, I, I speak to to a lot of uh, risk management students who are graduating, and when I uh, ask them how did you end up in in, in RMI, I mean you're very lucky. Like I'm very envious. I wish that I had done my RMI. A degree and and almost almost all of them say 
uh, Gamma Iota Sigma had, had, a, had a free pizza uh, event. I showed up and then they had a local insurance professional talk about what an awesome career it is. And, and next thing I know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm switching my major or declaring yeah. a concentration. Yeah, that's, that's, yep, yep, same. I mean, a lot of people in property restoration, you know, uh, signed up for an ad or had a friend doing it and then got into it. So, yeah. So outside of um, property restoration, I started doing some writing. Um, there's, in our, on our side of the industry, um, Restoration and Remediation Magazine is one of the biggest ones. And so, okay. uh, biggest networks, that is. And so I started writing with them. And then um, did, did your review, release that with them, and then saw that, uh, I don't remember if it was right away, you guys had started doing like blogs and articles and those kinds of things. So I started, you know, contributing to the insurance nerds network as well. And, um, and then, um, so kind of the same as, uh, as the shutdown happened, I had planned to reach out to a couple people to do some video interviews. I'd felt like on our side of things and property restoration, it was a lot of people interviewing the same people, like kind of over and over again. Okay. <laughs> And so I was trying to reach out to people that had maybe unique perspectives or could cast some light on different aspects of it. And uh, so I did a few of the, and man, there, you know, as you do it more, like, you know, you kind of get a little more in the swing of things and a little more comfortable with it, maybe a little better at it. But uh, um, you know, those first couple are pretty rough, but, uh, um, and then I reached out to a friend, um, uh, Jarrett Steer, he has the GMS podcast and I just asked him, you know, how are you releasing that as a podcast? And so he told me the program he was using and uh, I was like, okay, now I can release it as a video on YouTube and as an audio, um, you know, on the, so it's like the Dojo podcast, you can get on Spotify and Apple or obviously some of the more popular ones, but it syncs to other ones if people are on those programs too. So so that's uh, with the Diojo, I think, and I think it aligns a lot with what insurance nerds, right? You're trying to network and help people learn, you know, hey, who, who knows something about this? You're trying to shorten your learning curve, right? By, mm -hmm. Through your network. And, and so that's the goal on the Diojo podcast to try to reach out to people that pique my interest and, you know, maybe have some element they can shed some light on that will help somebody shorten their learning curve, you know, for professional development or technical skills, those kinds of things. On, so. on our side, the, the problem we were trying to solve w was lots of, of, uh, of young insurance professionals dropping out. So like, like you said, they didn't grow yeah. up wanting to work in insurance. They, they fell into insurance by accident. And, and then uh, <clears throat> they, they do it for two, three years. Don't find yeah. Right, the, the the first job they get doesn't happen to be great, and they just go to a different industry yeah. without seeing the great career that they could have had uh, if they had if yeah. they had to stuck around for a while. So, so we just we just wanted to to uh, uh, give the the advice that we had been really lucky to get, uh, which most people right. weren't getting, the mentorship that most people weren't getting, and and, and make that widely available to to anybody who who uh, googled for help, basically. Uh, so that's that's how, yeah, how it all yeah. starts. So yeah, kind of a, a similar uh, help you short circuit career growth to to do it to, yeah. to do it faster uh, shortcut career growth. Well, I love in in the book. Um, it's uh, you know people talk about you know people in positions of leadership talk about all the time. You know this generation, this this generation, that they're not loyal. And you and Carly brought out, um, and I, I quote it all the time, it's like, it's not that this generation or these coming generations aren't loyal. They just have a different definition of loyalty, right? And so, and you bring out that example, they've seen their grandparents and their parents give their lives to a company and then get the boot before they have to pay, right? The, the premiums on their retirement and those kinds of things. And so, um, and I was just talking to somebody else about that. It was like that quote where it says, um, uh, you know, a younger, young professionals definition of loyalty is I gave a hundred percent while I was there. And it really, it actually, it helped. It was in line with what I thought about as I hired people. Cause a lot of people, well, I don't want to hire you if you're only going to be here for six months. Well, I'd rather you be here for six months and kick butt, 
you know, then, um, you know, somebody stick around for five years and just drag it out, you know? So if I can have somebody super talented working here for six months and elevate, you know, and the other side of that is you never know, give them six months. And if you show them an opportunity and can communicate value and that there's opportunity, then they might stick around. It, it might be worth it, but, but exactly. Um, you, 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 you've free. got to, you, you, you've got to show them a path to success. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you can't just assume that they're going to stay yeah. Ju yeah. Ju just because you haven't fired them. Right. Um, right. If, if you haven't shown them a path to, to grow, um, even, even if they're comfortable, like I can't tell you how, yeah. how many, like, let's say mid career, you know, that like now in their thirties, 10, 15 years in, in the industry, uh, they're in a comfortable place. Right. But they're afraid that they're not growing, which is a yeah. very different perspective from the older right. generation who grew up with this expectation of lifetime employment, where yeah. if, if, if they were comfortable, that, that, that was fantastic. Like, yeah. uh, a, a lot, a lot, the boomers were, were raised to, to be workhorses. To, 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 right. uh, uh, it doesn't matter if you like the job. It doesn't matter if it's fulfilling. Your yeah. purpose is to work and provide for your family, period. Uh, and they, if, if, if you can be comfortable doing that, that's, that's a plus with, with the, with, with the younger generation, with, with the younger Gen Xers and especially the, the millennials, it's, it's way different. It, it really, it yeah. really, uh, they realize that, that there's no guarantee of lifetime employment. So yep. if I'm comfortable, but I'm no longer growing, yep. what happens yep. if the company doesn't need me? You know, after right. the, 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 down the road, and I, I stopped investing in myself. I stopped growing. So you have to constantly be providing that yeah. growth path, uh, and and constantly help yeah. helping them figure out how to grow uh, within the job, within the company, within within the industry. And and I think that's the tricky part because managers just were not trained for that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, and I think that's the biggest thing is is that, well, like on our industry, and I think it's similar in yours. Like, you take these. Uh, on I think it was episode 17 um this uh the morning tech meeting they have a real disciplined training program and it's more the soft skills development for technicians and those kinds of things and the dividends it pays but um you know it's if you're not doing those kinds of training um and like you said opening the doors for people then um, you know, they do get stagnant and those kinds of things, but then understanding too, different people want different things. And so, um, you know, sometimes you offer somebody something that, uh, it, or we just communicate it wrong. We think like, well, this is what I did. This is how I communicated with it. This is how I connected with it and, and not treating somebody as an individual and presenting it in a way that, um, they can grasp. And so I think exactly on our side, it, so many people phase out because they just turn them and burn them. Right. You know, and, mm -hmm. and rather than, you know, spending that time, I think there's multiple, multiple articles and I've written a few where it's like the cost of the turnover is, is incredible. You know, yeah. you, you spend all this money bringing somebody in, you, all your recruitment costs, all of your onboarding costs, all of your development costs, and then we let them walk out the door. And some people are proud of their turnover. You know, they're like, well, they couldn't hang it, you know, or they couldn't cut it. And it's like, it's just kind of a wrong mindset. And that was something I've always tried to think too, you know, even in your book, you bring up like people want more time off or more time with their family. And so it's like, how do you incorporate that our workloads are like this, you know, it, it, it mm -hmm. peaks and spikes and valleys. And so trying to figure out, you know, creative ways to incentivize people. And I was actually just talking to a contractor that really paid their people uniquely. Um, but they weren't, uh, he felt like they weren't appreciating it. And it, it, a lot of it came down to when we were talking about it, it's like, we need to pitch and you got to sell to your people, right. You know, as much as you sell to your client, and I think that's like you're talking about that development piece. If you have unique compensation packages or if there's other incentives for working at your company, business leaders need to understand to communicate those things better, you know, get inside the minds of the people that are, are coming in. Cause, and you make that point in the book, if you're ignoring the millennials then you're ignoring, what is it like 70 plus percent of the workforce? 
Uh, it's it's at, at this you point know. largest generation in the workforce, and uh, yeah. uh, as the boomers retire, uh, yeah. the extras are there's just not enough, uh, and they're just a giant. Millennials are a giant generation, and, and they're already they're all here in the workforce now. Uh, so yeah. so uh, we're gonna be the the big generation in the workforce for the next few decades. Uh, so 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 uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you, you've, you've got to learn, learn, learn to, to, to deal with us. Um, I am curious, uh, for, from the perspective of, of, of coming from, from, from the restoration side, uh, what, what advice do you have for, let's start with, with a young agent, uh, and then we'll also do a young claims adjuster. So, so for young agents, uh, from, okay. from your perspective, what, what are the things you, you see that, that like, like, their client, like the client complains to you about or that drive you crazy and make it harder to serve the client better? Yeah, well, like I said, you know, one of those obstacles is um, if, if you, I, I would assume, obviously, you become an insurance agent because you want to make some money, right? You, you see the opportunity. But also, you have to want to help people because that's it's a sales-heavy job. Like, it's, you've got to get to a certain threshold before mm-hmm. it even you're getting minimal returns on those policies um, and those have to add up before you're making a decent salary. And so um, I, you know, in a lot of ways it's, it's similar to, so in property restoration, you have these franchise models. And if you buy into a franchise, you're not only competing with all your competitors, you're competing with maybe the franchise one zip code over and, and the franchise company, cause they want to cash the check. They may put another guy you know, or another company, another zip code over. And so the same thing with insurance agents, you know, there's almost as ubiquitous as coffee shops, you know, so like, how do you distinguish yourself? Um, And especially on our side, on the agent side, when they don't know what they've sold, you know, they have no idea what's in the policy. That's not helpful to the client when they've undersold the client. So, um, and you guys preach that all the time, getting um, elevating your knowledge. Like if you're going to sell a product, you need to know what you're selling. And then um, know, I guess, for the company you work with, you know, what you can and can't do. Because for me personally, if there's no, um, if I'm not getting any service from it, then there really is no reason to have an agent. It's, it, you, you've made yourself obsolete, you know, mm-hmm. and so. A hundred percent. And so, you know, when, when your client has a fire, maybe not every water damage, a water damage, I would expect a phone call. And if it's their first ever, maybe you do go out there. Uh, fire damages are super impactful. So, you know, the, the Red Cross might go out there and provide them with initial services. But a lot of the good agents I've worked with, you know, they'll, a lot of the property restoration companies will offer to do the same. Like you put somebody up in a hotel or, you know, know who your clients are. Um, you know, the bigger the market, the harder that is. But uh, you know, just that same thing we've got to think about is that customer experience. So for the agent, if you're, especially if you're getting into it, know your product and then figure out how you're going to differentiate yourself through that customer experience. Um, and then um, you said for an adjuster. Mm-hmm. Yep. The adjusters. Um, <laughs> because I, because I, I would imagine that that is where the relationship is uh, adversarial. Uh, to, right, you, 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 you're, 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 I'm imagining you're, you're trying to do the job right. Yeah. And the adjuster is, is, is trying to keep the costs under control. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and yeah, it can be. So uh, uh, while that's true, there's plenty of contractors who have made bad names for, for our site as well by trying to inflate claims or do things that are, nefarious or, you know, charges because they think they can, you know, so, so it goes both ways. And that um, I, I think the most important thing for, I think adjusters and property restoration contractors to understand and clients, if you're a homeowner, cause homeowners can be terrible. Like, well, I heard about my friend that then they got this and they got this and they got this. So, uh, you know, what can you do for me? And it's like, no, that's, that's fraud. Um, so, um, the, the point is to restore you to pre-loss conditions, no more, no less. Mm-hmm. Now, that gets a little tricky. Um, a lot of insurance companies, say you have hardwood floors in your bathroom and, or tile, and that extends out into the hallway. 
okay, and then down right. into the kitchen. Well, a lot of that's a line of sight, right? Okay. But maybe the door lifts or it's like that tile was just installed. There's all these other factors that go into play to say, so maybe technically it stops there at the door, but like in the, the spirit of the claim or, you know, in, in making the customer whole, is that really um, the issue? And so a lot of where those arguments come into play is some of the grayer areas. Like if you have damage on one wall and I texture and paint that wall, are the other walls now going to look off if they're the same color? Cause maybe the paint's 10 years old, you know? So a lot of that stuff is, you know, negotiating or haggling or trying to, um, and sometimes it's like, you know, the, the trip over a dollar to save a dime and it happens on the, the adjuster side as well as the contractor side. Some of the arguments we get into are pretty silly. I can remember <laughs> this wasn't even an onsite adjuster. It was like a program. Um, and we ended up arguing for three days and they saved like eight cents, you know? And so it was like, you know, just, it was a waste of time, you know, just to argue over this minutia, um, you know? And then at some point though, as a contractor, you're like, no, I'm not going to take a deep cut. You know, I'm going to fight you tooth and nail line by line. And that's where we have to know what are the details of putting this back together, not necessarily the policy, but what's right, you know, and then the adjuster and, professionals so adjusters i um i think that's tricky i mean they've taken the industry almost every industry has taken more and more of those relationships and those um you know the ability for i know this guy they do this i can recommend them and vouch for them there's a lot less of that because we're so litigious and liability driven um but at the same time we've lost a lot of what makes the economy great in like a local market strong is those relationships. So it's, it's tricky, you know, like in the big picture, you want to have a McDonald's experience, but you know, we're not making burgers. We're fixing houses and most restoration companies, like, you know, I would have like 30 files at a time, you know? So, um, you know, it's, it makes it tough to, um, you know, really dial in and, and always deliver a great experience. Yeah. And the, the adjuster has the exact same problem, right? 30 yeah, pounds at, yeah. at, at a time. And, uh, well, and they may be, yeah, they may be three States or maybe they're a whole region, especially if there are larger law loss adjuster. Yeah. I mean the, the travel time and <laughs> trying to juggle all the things and um, yeah, it's uh it's, it's interesting that, uh, that it's part of why I really enjoy it because it's always something new and there's always a new challenge and there's the, you know, a big relationship piece, you know, and multiple people all involved in one, one claim, you know. Okay. And, and if I, if I remember correctly for, for the last few years, you, you've been more involved with, with the asbestos and kind of the environmental piece of it. So, yeah. So yep. So, so tell me, tell me about that side. How, how was that transition? Uh, and uh, what, what is the work like on, on that side? Asbestos is, is an interesting thing. If, you, if you're a young insurance professional or even like approaching middle-aged insurance professional like me, uh, because uh, this mess precedes us. So yes. we, we, we've, we didn't see it happen, right? Right, we, right. So asbestos... Uh, is just kind of this bad word that cost yep. has cost the industry billions and billions and millions of dollars, which continues to be a problem today. Uh, yeah. That's really all we know about it. Uh, so, so, yep. so, so, so what's it like kind of on that type of work on, 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 on the field? What, what do you, what do you guys do exactly? Well, so when, when I got started in the industry, it was about 2002. It was 2002. And um, it was the mold is gold era. And I was down in California. And so most of the stuff we do for mold comes out of the protocols from asbestos as far as like setting up containment, having negative air pressure, wearing suits, wearing masks, um, and then, you know, getting your work site to a dust free environment. And so, um, we we commented because we had at that time the company I was with had thought about adding an asbestos abatement um, division, and we thought, well, in theory, so mold will always mold is ubiquitous. Mold can grow; it just needs moisture, humidity, and you know an organic food source, right? And so we'll never get rid of mold. Um, 
Whereas asbestos, in theory, there's a limited amount that they put into homes and businesses and we've been, you know, basically abating it since, you know, the late 70s, mid late 70s. So in theory, we should be running out of it, but it uh, it seems well, to just for, keep for, popping for up. <laughs> How is it? And and I, I went to college in 2002, and yep. uh, at Iowa State University, uh, my first uh, I lived in the dorms, and then I moved to a fraternity. In the dorms, I, I remember my very first night sleeping in the in the dorms. Uh, I had a single room bunk bed. So my desk was below and the desk on top. And, and basically the, the roof uh, uh, or the, the ceiling is ceiling. just a few inches from, from, from where you're sleeping. Yep. And it, it has a, a big sign basically, or, or like the wall has a big <laughs> sign saying no. asbestos, do not no. mess with it. Like do not like nail yeah, anything. Keep it away. Right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> 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 and, and I, I I had never even heard of, of, of asbestos. Yeah. I, I thought it was like, okay, so, so if you know that this shit's toxic, yeah. it's still there. And, and at that time, yeah, I yeah, yeah. know that they've known for 30 years that it was toxic. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, how, if we've known since the 70s, how do we still have? <laughs> yeah, well, it, I mean, the, it's the power of good marketing because <laughs> like in the 60, 50s and 60s, it was the miracle I mean, um, if you haven't ever looked it up, look up, you know, um, the old marketing asbestos for asbestos. advertising and, um, and, but it was a superior product for like fireproofing and durability and bonding. You know, that's why it's in, you know, vinyl mastics and, you know, the popcorn ceiling and, and, um, uh, coatings for, you know, trunk lines and, and heat lines and those kinds of things. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm always surprised. It's just, you know, we, we do uh, a crap ton of residential and commercial work. Um, and like you said, schools, and it's just, you know, <laughs> it hasn't been, um, it seems like there's plenty of it still out there because almost every job. And two, uh, they didn't completely discontinue the use. Um, like people were able to use what they had in stock and then other countries are still using it. And so um, like in, in Washington, you have to test I give the example, basically, if the house was built, you got the keys yesterday, and in a week you decide, you know what, I want to open that wall up so there's an open wall between the kitchen and the, the dining room or whatever. In theory, you're supposed to test by the letter of the law, um, even though that was built, you know, yesterday. So, um, and that's, you know, thanks to California, I think that's, you know, kind of the, the, the intent of the rules for demolition and uh, especially in commercial structures and those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it should be, we should be reaching the end of it. But the thing is like, once it, say we rid the world of asbestos, there's going to be something else that's bad for us, you know, that, um, causes cancer and is the next thing that, uh, everybody focuses on. And the reality, like asbestos for the most part in a lot of these spots, as long as you leave it alone, you know, it is safe right you know it's not going to impact so it's not you. getting into the air yeah yeah which is like if you're sleeping six feet from it <laughs> and if it was popcorn you know that i uh, would argue whether that's safe or not but you know they probably had it painted over or something but uh yeah that's uh that's an interesting yeah i can i can remember that same time that you're sleeping in that bunk bed you know we're thinking like what who would get into asbestos it's going to be gone in a couple of years <laughs> here we are so yeah um but yeah, there's just a lot more, uh, you know, with abatement with mold, um, there's not other than like California, I think Texas and Florida, it's not regulated. So it doesn't have to go to a special landfill. Um, there's recommendations and protocols, but there's not like legal um, regulatory fines and things. And like, whereas with asbestos, you hear about people all the time doing the wrong thing, whether um, purposely or inadvertently and, and, you know, causing problems and those kinds of things. So, yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there, uh, I'm just wondering if you've seen it, is there, is there like cross pollination, uh, people going, uh, like, ha have you seen people from your side going into claims, uh, or the other way around claims, people going in, into, into, uh, in, yeah in, in, into water and and uh um, yeah 
Well, every everybody always thinks the other guy's making more money, right? Okay. So if you're in property restoration, you think the adjuster's making more money. Or there's another piece of that puzzle. The in-between is um, third-party consultants. Um, so some of the biggest are like JS Held or Young and Associates. So on large losses, um, they might be called by the insurance company to do a review on a big mitigation or a repairs project. So um, you probably see a, a lot more restoration people going the consultant route. Um, you do see from time to time, um, I had a friend, a very close friend of mine, he went into independent adjusting and, um, you know, storm chasing, you know, uh, Katrina, when Katrina hit, um, you know, he, like you said, young person seeing that there's not opportunities to grow in property restoration in our local office. And so, you know, he took the course uh, to become an adjuster and it just so happened that when he took that course happened to be one, one of the biggest events in the last several years hit. And, uh, and <laughs> I mean, he got the call and he's like, I got to go, you know, I don't think I can turn this down. And so, um, you know, I think that's a lot of people understand you have to make your own opportunities, right? So, you know, maybe you see it, maybe you think it's better. Um, a lot of property restoration people, especially old school mindset, they think, well, I'll hire an adjuster. They know how to do Xactimate. They've got all the connections. It'll make the process better. But what they don't understand is like an adjuster, adjuster has interaction with a file, but they don't have to actually manage or see it through to completion in the same way that a contractor does. They're definitely so not, not a project come, manager. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. they come to this side and now they have the same amount of files, maybe more, and they also have to run the jobs or be involved in putting a production plan and a budget and those kind of things together. Um, it's a lot different. It's a lot different analyzing to make sure everything's on track and where it should be, as opposed to like making it happen, you know, hands on in the field, you know, those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, so there, there is cross pollination, but I think a lot of times it's people just thinking, well, that side has it better, you know, and so, or there's more money over there. And, uh, and realizing, you know, if you started here, that's probably, you probably have better opportunities in that pipeline than than switching pipelines but some people do it interesting okay um yeah that's that's all i've got today uh but, but uh great chatting with you with you john uh it's it's, it's always been fun to interact with you and i i, I, I like how um uh, you're out there making your own luck basically making your own opportunities yeah uh, very similar to the way that I've done it on, on, on my side with, 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 with an insurance. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll make sure to link on the show notes to, uh, the Diojo. Uh, and then you said that, that that has links to, to like the new book and, and the, the, the articles you did and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah. We have, um, the Diojo and, uh, forward slash book is the book. And then, the Diojo podcast has its own uh, website as, as well, the Diojopodcast.com. And so are, uh, how about you? Are you working on a second book? Are you and Carly uh, teaming up the <laughs> power team again? We've got new generations now. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. So uh, uh, Carly is, is managing uh, – our production of other people's books. I really have nothing to do yeah. with them. It help market them. Uh, so between that and her day job, that's kept her busy. Uh, I am supposed to be writing uh, two books this year, 2020. Okay. Uh, and I, I, I kind of expect it to be done with both by now. Yeah. And uh, you yeah, would yeah, think yeah. that with a global pandemic yeah. keeping me home, uh, and giving me lots of time because I'm not traveling, yeah. I will be doing a lot of that. And I have not written a word of either book. Uh, so so, oh, so it's one of those like, like when, uh, when, when inspiration strikes <laughs> and it just hasn't. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I'm, so, I'm supposed yeah. to, to, to be writing the Gen C, the, the Gen Z, version of insurance tomorrow so kind of the, the next next generation because like, like, as you said they're here uh, and i have not 
done a thing. And I, I, I'm also supposed to be writing the career side. Uh, so, so basically, ensuring tomorrow, oh. the, 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 the vision wa was, um, what was okay here's the guide on, on how to manage millennials and hey young insurance professionals here is your yes. kind, your, your guide on how to grow with an insurance that one i, I yeah. wrote the the table of contents uh about oh. th about three years ago and i okay. i i originally was going to do it with carly and nick but we never got it done so eventually last year late last year i suggested uh, to to another friend that they joined me in writing, in writing that book, and she said yes, and we just haven't done it. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. so we have like the outline, and uh, some chapters have a little bit of actual meat in them, but it, it's it, yeah. So so we'll we'll see someday. <laughs> yeah, it's that that process. Yeah. So well, it's funny. Yeah. Um, I, so episode 22 of the Diojo podcast, I had, um, author named Lex Sisney on and he wrote a book called organizational physics. And so applying physics to setting up and growing an organization. Oh, wow. Um, but he said one of his writing habits is, um, he's made a deal with himself. I think it's five days a week. He's supposed to write a certain amount. And he says, if he doesn't reach that goal, he has to make a financial contribution just enough so that it hurts uh, to a candidate that he absolutely that he hates. doesn't like. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's proper priority management uh, for, for, for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the pandemic has seen me uh, doing my day job, recording yep. podcasts and uh, playing a lot of video games, which I really enjoy. Uh, <laughs> so, so yep. video games have gotten priority in, in, in my uh, in my in my downtime, uh, yeah. over productive things like writing the next book. And well, have you um, do like audio record, like just record your thoughts as you're playing. If you get a, <laughs> I mean, I'm always like stopping, pulling over, and writing the notes or recording here and there. That um, that that might be the way. That might be the way. Yeah, so yeah. No, no promises because before, like in, last year, I've promised that the books would come out this year. Yeah, and I've done nothing with them, so no promises. Uh, they'll come out when yeah. they come out. How uh, can so when you guys wrote the first book, how do you you get it done right? And then it, it's inevitable you'll do another read through, and you're like, oh crap, you know, and you want to change this and change that. How do you for, how did you force yourself to just hit the send button or publish? I I I am not a perfectionist. Okay. So it it it, it took some all nighters coming down to be, because. That we we I I announced it. Uh, yeah. I, I I announced it in April. Uh, against uh, like Carly didn't know that I announced it. Car <laughs> Car Carly, this is a really good story. So 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 we used to always go to to the CPCU uh, leadership yep. summit in, in April and the annual meeting in in, in September October. Uh, and, and I still go. She she doesn't really go anymore, but I still go right during when when, when they actually happen with COVID right yeah. now. But so, so anyway, so, so, so I, I land in, I don't know, uh, San Antonio, Texas, probably for, for, for the, uh, for, for, for the leadership summit. And I know that she's, she's, uh, drow Baltimore, Maryland. I land in Baltimore, Maryland. And, and I know that she's driving from Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> so, so she won't see her phone for a few hours. So she won't be able to tell me to take it down. Uh, so I go ahead and, and we've, we've been writing it, but it, it's yeah. not like, like she just by her nature uh, would not want me to publicly tell anybody the book's coming out until we have like a pretty final draft. Like, 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 yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like we're just kind of like doing the, the very final things. That's not where we were. Like, like, like we, we, we had put a lot of work into it. We were definitely in the thick of it, but we probably had another like month and a half before we had a, a, a finished draft. Um, yeah. like I finished first draft, uh, and I announced it to the world and I took advantage of the CPCU event to, to get some boss around. Sure. Everybody knows. Yeah. There. Uh, so, so we had serious pressure to, to, uh, to, 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 to get it done by the date that I, that I said it would come out by. Um, and, and that kept, that kept us going and, and we finished. Yeah. It. Um, so, yeah. so, so, and, and what, 
shipped and done. Uh, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I shipped and done. Uh, the, the, the reviews were good. Yeah. I, I, the, yeah. I, I, I don't think that I've reread it. Uh, what I, I did listen to the audiobook version that's never been released because Audible's never approved it. But, but so that, that's when I went back through the whole thing. Is is I listened to the audiobook version, uh, and, huh. and yeah, I'm 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 not a a like keep fixing stuff until it's perfect. Yeah. I, I I am a, a ship is better than perfect. Uh, yeah, type person. So personality wise, it's just not a problem for me. Yeah, but yeah. Mo- most authors will will tell you, uh, don't go back and reread your book because exactly you'll want to change things. Yeah, it, and just, it, it's just an endless cycle. Exactly, yeah, yeah. or if you're gonna <laughs> read it, read it as a reader, like like the yeah, forget the fact that it's your book because it is what it is. Um, yeah. um, unless you you want to you know put out a, a an updated and new version, in, in which case okay, like, but uh. Yeah, yeah. Ours like the reviews were good. It it, it sold. It, it got me my, my 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 new job that I have today that I love. It got me a lot of speaking engagements. It it did more than I expected yeah. it to do. Uh, it worked out. Yep, yep. Crazy. Well, cool, man. Well, thank you so much for having me on and for continuing to. Uh, it's fun to see your your. Uh, network grow and and all the things that you're doing you guys are doing a great job so thank you for coming on the podcast have yep. a great one right, man. see you bye